Entrepreneurial Edge is brought to you by Business Banking from FNB. Because small ideas can lead to big business. FNB, how can we help you? Hello and a very warm welcome to the Entrepreneurial Edge. I'm Chris Bishop. Now sit back and close your eyes and think about what you would rather do this cold winter. Maybe your thoughts may stray to a luxury cruise to the warm waters of blue ocean far away. Imagine lying on a deck in the sun with a cool drink in your hand. Now, despite the recession, despite the credit crunch, it appears more and more people are cruising away these days. That's the word from this week's entrepreneur, George Argiopoulos. He's made a fortune in the cruising business, and we'll be talking to him in a moment about the whys and wherefores of the luxury cruise. But first, let's take a closer look at what he does. George happened to come to South Africa in the early 90s and worked for a Greek cruise line called Iperitiki Cruises who had representation in Johannesburg and I was actually working at the company at the time and I think once he arrived here he realised that this particular market had huge potential for a cruise only agency. In those days you had a lot of tour operators that represented various travel products not specifically cruise lines. And George saw this as an opportunity to open up an agency with an, ex with an exclusive idea of, of having the largest cruise line agency representation in South Africa. So in 1992, he decided to, to open up Cruises International with just his charm and his briefcase and Ipratiki Cruises. And that was 20 years ago, so we're actually celebrating our 20 year anniversary this year. And in time, George acquired the agency for Royal Caribbean International, then Celebrity Cruises and Crystal, and we now represent nine cruise lines in our portfolio. We currently are South Africa's largest cruise representation company in, in Southern Africa. Um, we have quite an eclectic cruise portfolio, uh, ranging from mass market cruising, which is mass tourism with Royal Caribbean and Celebrity Cruises, we have a luxury portfolio where we represent small ship luxury cruising to large ship luxury cruising. We represent a, comp a cruise line in that um, it can be chartered, uh, both in Greece, uh, variety cruises, but so small ship cruising or yachting, and in the Caribbean with Sea Dream. And we've just acquired the agency for Ama Waterways, which is a European uh, river company, which has in fact, I say European, they're a, a waterway company that operates on rivers in the Far East as well as Europe. Just in terms of, of the, the consequences of the Concordia incident in January, it affected the European markets in a far bigger way than it affected the South African market. A, geographically, we are much further away. And I think as South Africans, we are such hardy travellers that things like that don't necessarily hit us in the same way that they would a market like Italy where the accident, the incident occurred. Um, in terms of the press coverage, there was an incredible amount of coverage and to a certain extent a lot of sensationalism. It was an absolute tragedy um, and it certainly affected the cruising. It's in, it's in January, it's the beginning of a new year, a new cruising year and the ripple effects of that are still being felt in our industry. Um, again in the European markets and quite a big way in the American markets. Um, because of this, the European markets are taking, because of what, you know, the, the sort of backlash of the, the economy in Europe, we are having to pick up quite a bit of, of business that is outstanding because of the European markets being so slack at the moment. I have in the studio with me, I have the man himself, George Argiopoulos, the founder of Cruises International. So, George, just tell us, you come from an entrepreneurial family, your, both your father and your grandfather were engineers. Uh, did you try to follow in their footsteps? Well, I think initially I thought I had no choice but to become an engineer. And what did you do? Um, well, after I finished school, and my father had studied in uh, Montreal at McGill University just after the war, so it was almost a natural uh, progression that I would follow in his footsteps and found myself in Montreal uh, in the engineering school there. And that's a little story, isn't it? Because you, your, the connection with Montreal was because your father actually left Greece with the troops who'd been yeah. fighting in Greece. And just tell us a bit about that. Yeah, he caught a ride on a, on a troop carrier from Athens all the way to New York. Uh, it was just after the war. The troops were going back home. And it was just about for the civil war to break out in, in Greece. So 
he decided it was best for him to to leave and find his fortune overseas and of course primarily to study and he studied over there in Canada and in New York and then he came back on holiday to Greece and what happened well he met my mother <laughs> <laughs> at a wedding party of his cousin so <laughs> and that was and it so but you studied two years yourself uh, engineering uh, and then what happened well uh, as part of my curriculum was a course called economics for engineer and I found my calling honestly it was uh, almost like a revelation and I think probably was the only A I had gotten up to that point <laughs> in any of the subjects so it took me a long time to uh, accept the fact that um, I enjoyed economics very much and I saw that I could do very well at it and um, I announced to my father that um, I didn't want to follow the path of engineering and what did he say take over he says that I must follow my calling and actually he says engineering is a very lonely profession so maybe I uh, enjoy more to be out with the, with the people. And then you came back, uh, went back home to Greece and uh, as you said earlier uh, when you were choosing work the sea is in your blood. What happened then? Yes, well I always had a close affinity to the sea with water sports and sailing. I used to work uh, for my summer holidays often on, on yachts. Uh, and then when I finished my, my studies, uh, my father knew an owner, one of the owners of a Greek uh, cruise line was based in Piraeus in Athens. And I started working at the uh, marketing department. And I was responsible for uh, the tour operators and our big clients in Europe. So it gave me additional exposure, traveling a lot around Europe and meeting the clients and understanding how the the cruise industry and the market, the uh, tourist market in general, it works. What was it like in those early days, learning the, the cruise business, which was eventually to be your life? It was very interesting and very excited. And, um, you know, I always had the dream of one day running my own business. And I could see the value in cruising and how much people enjoyed it and what the potential was, because in those days, it was very, very small numbers of consumers that would choose to go on a cruise. So I always had that belief that it would be a growing industry and had a lot to offer, much more than what people understood. And then fast forward after you'd learned the trade, they asked you to come to Africa to see what was happening about 1991. Just tell us what happened Yeah, there. after a short stint in New York, I spent about a year and a half there. Uh, they asked me to come to South Africa and you know, study the potential of South Africa being a source market for our operations in uh, Mediterranean and the Caribbean. And I came out here and I really fell in love with the country and the people and again, the standard of living, people were prone to traveling, so I thought there was great potential here for someone to market and sell the idea of, of cruising. And just paint us a picture of that time. Uh, it was the tail end of sanctions on South Africa in apartheid days. What was the state of the cruise industry in those days? In South Africa or in, generally globally? In generally, yeah. Well, it was at the beginning of the, uh, the takeoff phase. Uh, new ships, purpose-built ships were, were being built. There was big investments. A couple of the cruise lines were just about to go public. Uh, more and more destinations were being visited by ships. The prices were coming down. So it was really the right time to introduce uh, that concept of, of holidaying and traveling. How would you estimate that the industry since the time you've been here which is 21 years has grown uh, in this country alone would you say i mean we're talking 10 times no, 100 it, times it, it's grown beyond my wildest dreams i remember when we first started we sold about 300 cruises in our first year my dream was to reach a thousand that would really be the ultimate uh, we finished uh, 2011 with 17,000. so the growth is, uh, is really tremendous. So what happened? You came here for a year working for the company that posted you here. Then you went back and you came back and started working on your own, with your own completely alone. Um, just tell us about the humble beginnings of Cruises International. Well, they were very humble indeed. And, uh, indeed. and um, I went back to them once I saw that there was a good potential for someone to establish this kind of business here. I went back to my employers and I said, you know, instead of employing me, I'll start an agency for your marketing agency and then you'll become my first customer. So that is really how, you know, we started the business on, on that promise and um, it did very well. I never had to go into overdraft or borrow money or uh, um, 
I went to another company in the travel industry. I rented a desk that they had spare. Um, they gave me a telephone line and all that on the promise of a profit share in my future <laughs> profits. And uh, that really allowed me to uh, set up an operation without requiring any capital up front. How did you feel on that first day when you sat down there at a borrowed desk with your telephone and thought, well, this is the rest of my life? What did you feel? I mean, entrepreneurs often get that feeling at the beginning. What did you feel? Very scared and excited. And as I said before, I always had the dream of running my own business one day. And I mean, it was a dream come true for me. And, you know, some advice I always give to people who ask me, if, you know, how they can go into their own business is it's not very hard to cover a month's salary if you're running your own business. So that is really what kind of the, uh, what I based myself against. My benchmark was to cover my salary I was earning up to that point. And it didn't prove to be very hard. I think the hardest thing was to gain the, uh, the confidence of our travel agent partners because we sell most of our cruises through uh, the retail travel agents in South Africa. So I had to spend a lot of time being, visiting them, talking to them, educating them, making them feel confident in the product and in myself. And what was it like that moment when you sold your first cruise as an entrepreneur? <laughs> Can't tell us. <laughs> what was it like? How did it feel? It's elated. You know, it's like your team scoring their first goal in a, in a match. And, and in one reservation, I had made enough money to sustain me for a month. And that really, it's, it's a relief. There's a lot of enthusiasm and, of course, an amazing encouragement to, to carry on and do more. And how fast did it pick up? I mean, how you said you'd never been in overdraft. You've never borrowed money. Obviously, your costs were quite low and your overheads were low. But how fast was it, you think, from the start to when you felt you were making a, a comfortable living out of it, or more than comfortable. How long did it take you? I think about a year, 18 months, that let's say I was spending less than what I was earning on a personal and on a business uh, level. And now you've got about 20 people working for you. How important do you think it is for entrepreneurs to surround yourselves with the right people? I mean, was it not Niccolo Machiavelli who said you can judge a man from the people he has around him? Uh, Absolutely. What do you say? What do Absolutely. you say? How difficult was it to find those people? You know what? You learn by mistakes, unfortunately, especially when it comes to hiring people. I think I was very fortunate that my first couple of employees were proved to be real stars and very loyal. Um, and I think that the biggest challenge is to have a proper process of selecting people. Nowadays, we do not even interview someone before they do a psychometric test. And I'm amazed how accurate they are and they predict things that might happen in the future. In these early days, what were the tough times for you? I mean, when was it difficult for you? I think uh, from a business point of view, certainly the volatility in politics, uh, the uncertainty of the future, um, there was a lot of areas where South Africans were not allowed to visit, so we couldn't sell certain destinations and certain cruises because of that. Um, the currency volatility. Uh, so these were really the challenges from a, from a business perspective. Was there ever a day when you felt like throwing it all in? Never. Never? Never. <laughs> and what, what, was the day, what, what was the day you thought, from the day you started, when you look back and you thought, I've made it? Or you don't even think that to this day? You know what? I think if I ever think that, that will be the start of my downfall and uh, the downfall of the business. I mean, you never make it. And as I say to my colleagues and employees, that more people die coming down from Everest than when they're trying to get up to Everest. So, <laughs> uh, you know, once you sit there and relax and you think you've achieved it, is you getting very close to death. Mm. <laughs> well, that's a good uh, little homily for an entrepreneur there. Um, and the company now, uh, how do you see it maybe in, in 10, 20 years' time? Uh, we'll talk more in the second half, but what's your, what is your view for the expansion there from where you are now? The potential to expand in Africa and Southern Africa in general is absolutely huge. Uh, if I look at the percentage of Americans who've taken a cruise so far, which is close to 16%, uh, and we do probably less than 1% in the South African market alone. Uh, and looking at the 
proposition that a cruise presents to consumers, I really wouldn't, I would dare to say maybe increase 10 times in 10 years. And uh, what kind of turnover are you talking over about at the moment and how do you hope to grow it looking ahead? Well, our, our gross turnover in 2011 was $17 million. $17 million. Yes. So that's, a fair, that's a fair size and what's your so target? It could be, depends on, 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 the, uh, on the horizon, but if we talk over the next 10 years, maybe 100 million or more. And, um, with your, and your, your parents, I mean, you mentioned that um, they're still in Greece and stuff. Have, have you ever uh, thought about taking them on a cruise? Well, they've been on lots of cruises. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, well, all right then. Well, we'll talk a lot more in the second half about the issues around the business. But it's time for a quick ad break now. We'll see you right after this.